So the Seven of Cups is all about dreams and illusions. Like sausages. Maybe think about a wider variety of things. Right, like chorizo and bratwurst. Let's think even bigger. What, bacon? Okay, uh, let's stop thinking about pork products for a moment. We're talking about grand dreams and visions. Ah, oh, right, like a full English breakfast. Welcome back to Kippy's Quest. This week we're doing an overview of the miners. What, like coal miners? Uh, no. So anyway, we've been through the major arcana with its lofty ideals, and now we're moving on to something that's a little more relatable. 56 cards split into four suits, covering every aspect of the human experience. Arcana is the Latin word for secret, so the tarot is effectively split into big secrets and small secrets, and right now we're talking about the small secrets, the gossip, the stuff we see every day. The year is 1910. No, it isn't. I know, but it is for the purposes of this section. The year is 1910. Why are you making it look like that? Television wasn't invented for another 20 years. I know, I'm just trying to add to the vibe. The year is 1910. The place is London in the UK, and the occult society known as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn had collapsed seven years earlier. However, two members of that order, Arthur Edward Waite and Pamela Coleman Smith, decided to release a tarot deck through the Rider Publishing Company. Now, they didn't expect it to be particularly successful. Tarot was generally seen as the domain of mystics at the time, but this deck was different. It had the usual depictions of the major arcana in all their glory, but where earlier decks only showed geometric patterns for the miners, the Waite Smith card had illustrations for every card. This captured the imagination of the public and led to a revolution in tarot reading. Now, it's rumoured that Waite wasn't overly involved in the designs of the miners. In his key to the tarot, he barely talks about them, certainly not to the extent that he does with the majors. Pamela Coleman Smith was seemingly given creative control over these 56 cards. Now, completely flying in the face of what I just said, this wasn't actually the first tarot deck to feature illustrations on the miners. It has been claimed that Smith took inspiration from a much older deck called the Solar Busker Tarot, which was created in the 15th century and also had full artwork for each card. However, this particular deck has been largely ignored until fairly recently, so it would seem that the world wouldn't be ready for a fully illustrated tarot deck until about 400 years later, when the Wade Smith deck was published. Despite this, we are going to be looking at the Solar Busker Tarot because it's interesting and a little bit freaky. Many esoteric readers still prefer the older designs, claiming that the images on the rider pack are too specific and distracting. Some even claim to get some kind of psychic insight just from looking at the patterns on the older cards. The problem is that you need a pretty extensive knowledge of correspondences in order to make sense of them, which doesn't really help the beginner. For this reason, we're going to be mainly sticking with the rider weight cards, but we'll be looking at the correspondences too, so hopefully we'll get the best of both worlds. So the minor arcana is split into four suits. Wands, cups, swords and pentacles. Two of the suits did change when we got to the Wade Smith Tarot. Earlier decks had batons or rods instead of wands and coins or discs in place of pentacles. These would eventually evolve into the suits we see on modern day playing cards. Batons became clubs, cups became hearts, swords turned into spades and coins evolved into diamonds. You can even use regular playing cards as a tarot deck if you want to, but then of course you don't get the trumps or the funky designs. The only major arcana card to survive was the Fool, who became the Joker. Terrible Joker in our case. However, Waite wanted the suits of their deck to reflect the tools or weapons of ritual magic, just as we see on the table in front of the Magician back at number one in the Majors. This was to mark it out specifically as an esoteric tarot deck. Also, Waite wanted to expand the meaning of coins from simply being about money to encompass the whole physical and material world, so he changed it to pentacles. Within the four suits, the cards are separated into three further categories, starting with the aces. These represent the core concept and potential of each suit. Next, we've got what we call the pip cards, which go from two to ten. These symbolize situations, which we can see in the designs on the cards. Lastly, we've got the court cards, the kings, queens, knights and pages. These represent the ages and personalities of people who will influence the subject of the reading. The kings generally stand for responsibility and for whoever is in charge of a specific situation. The queens represent the emotional and creative aspect of each suit. The knights symbolize action and making things happen, while the pages represent youthfulness, simplicity and new beginnings. Now the court cards don't necessarily need to refer specifically to men or women, but rather the masculine and feminine aspects of each suit. These are slightly different in Alistair Crowley's Thoth Tarot, where he's gone with knights, queens, princes and princesses, but the basic concepts are the same. This brings us on to the correspondences for each suit. 
These derive from the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, specifically the Cypher Manuscripts. The Cypher what? A brief history of the Cypher Manuscripts. The Cypher Manuscripts is a compendium of 60 texts that outline magic initiation rituals according to the Four Elements. The Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn used this work to form the basis of their magical grade system. The manuscripts are said to originate from a German magical adept named Anna Sprengel, and eventually came into the possession of Golden Dawn founders William Westcott and Samuel McGregor Mathers. However, there is no evidence to support this claim and the origin of the text remains unknown. Despite this, the manuscripts inform the correspondences for the Rider Waite tarot deck. Now, if you're a beginner, I don't want you to think that you have to memorize all of these correspondences before you can start using the tarot. I'm putting them here for reference and to explain why each card represents the concepts we see in the illustrations. However, the most important aspect of tarot reading lies in your intuition and how you interpret the images. I've said before that our connection to the cards is as individual as our fingerprint, and the best way to learn the tarot is to just start reading. So with that in mind, first and foremost are the elements. The wands represent fire, which translates to will, action and desires. The cups symbolize water, which stands for emotions, reflection and relationship. Swords represent air, which translates to thought, intellect and conflict. Finally, the pentacles represent earth, the physical and material realm. This is where we see the other elements manifested into something solid and tangible. Each suit also corresponds to an archangel, a season and a letter from the tetragrammaton. Yod Heh Vav Heh, the four-letter Hebrew name of God. Wands correspond to Michael, Archangel of the South, Season of Summer, and to the Hebrew letter Yod. Cups go with Gabriel, Archangel of the West, Season of Autumn, and the first Hebrew letter Heh. Swords correspond to Raphael, Archangel of the East, Season of Spring, and the Hebrew letter Vav. Finally, pentacles go with Oriel, Archangel of the North, Season of Winter, and the second Hebrew letter Heh. Next up, we've got the astrological correspondences, and my friend Tallulah is in charge of those. These are taken from the relative degrees of the zodiac wheel and one of the seven classical planets. This gives us a star sign and planet for each pip card, and several star signs for the court cards and aces. The suits as a whole, however, correspond to the signs of their elements. Therefore, wands are represented by the fire signs, Aries, Leo and Sagittarius. Cups are represented by the water signs, Cancer, and Scorpio and Pisces, Swords go with the air signs, Libra, Aquarius and Gemini. And finally, the pentacles are represented by the earth signs, Capricorn, Taurus and Virgo. Next, we've got the herbal correspondences for each card. Again, these tend to fit with the relative elements and seasons. My friend Ange is going to be helping me out with those. Ange actually grows her own herbs and very kindly sends me one every month, together with a little note explaining how it connects to a tarot card. For example, this month we've got some ginger, which goes with the Eight of Pentacles. <laughs> Finally, and some might say most importantly, comes the position of each card on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, which my friend Jess is going to be helping me out with. We have talked about this in previous videos, but as a quick primer, the Tree of Life is a map of 10 aspects of creation and reality that originated in the mystical school of Kabbalism. The tree contains 10 spheres or sephirot, which each represent an aspect of human experience. Between the sephirot there are 22 paths, with each path corresponding to a card of the major arcana. However, in terms of the minors, we attribute the individual cards to a specific sephirot. For example, the fifth sephirot of Geberah is associated with conflict, and we can see that reflected in the fives of each suit. The tree is then broken up into four distinct worlds. At the top is the world of Absolute. This is the archetypal world. Next is the world of Bria, which is the creative world. Following that is the world of Yetzirah, or the formative world. And finally, at the bottom, we find Asiyah, the manifest world. Now there are two ways of looking at the worlds. One is to split the tree of life into four sections, with Absolute at the top and RCR at the bottom. Or we can imagine a full tree living in each world. This way works much better for the minor arcana, as it allows us to be more specific in terms of the placement of each card. So for example, all of the wands sit in the fiery world of Absolute, while the pentacles exist in the solid world of RCR. The only remaining thing to talk about is the hermetic title for the cards, which is going to be handled by my friend Lisa. This is a title that was given to each card by the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, and was a way of distilling all of the correspondences down into a single title. Hopefully this will make it a little easier to understand. So there we are, I think we're about ready to begin the next stage of our journey. For now, I'll leave you with this quote from Rachel Pollock. The tarot demonstrates many things, some very unexpected, these things emerge through interpretation of the tarot's images. 
through joining ourselves to those images in meditation and through seeing the combinations formed in readings. Taken separately, the cards of the Minor Arcana present us with a grand panorama of human experiences. Together, and in union with the archetypal Major cards, they draw us into ever wider knowledge of the changing wonder of life. Thank you for joining us once again on Kippy's Quest. May the coming days bring you energy, curiosity, and the enthusiasm to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Until next time.